Hey everybody, Ethan here from WordTech, back with another video, and today I'm bringing you my review of the BlackBerry Key 1. I've been using it as my daily driver for about two months, but the question is, has it stayed my daily driver, or have I switched back to something like the Galaxy S8? Find out at the end of the video. So to go ahead and start with the design, as I usually do, it's a very industrial device, and I actually quite like the design myself, but obviously it does come down to personal preference. But I think from the, the soft touch back, which is very fingerprint resistant actually, quite impressed with that, along with the metal rails on all sides and the Gorilla Glass 4 on the screen, it's a very well built and very good looking device. It's very, very shiny, it uh, gets people looking, people, you pull it out, they go, what phone is that? They ask questions. It's not your common slab of glass and glass or metal and metal. There's a lot of uniqueness to it, especially I think the soft touch back really, really helps emphasize that obviously along with the keyboard, which the keyboard itself I think is a very good design. I like the font actually a lot too. And it's just overall the device is incredibly good looking. Now there is a camera bump uh, on the back, which I think looks nice actually, which is kind of weird. Normally it's just a piece of glass, but this one has a little metal rim around it. There's uh, not very little actually in terms of uh, camera bumps, but it's still a little bit bothersome to me the fact that it does have a camera bump. I really wish that companies would just start to move away from that, increase the thickness of the device a little bit more, and give it a bigger battery, but more on the battery life of this device later. And uh, overall, I just, I like the design. The buttons match the side, and they're also metal. The whole device is uh, metal uh, other than that soft touch coating on the back, and obviously the keys, which are a uh, kind of like a, almost like a smooth rubberized plastic. They're a really interesting uh, smooth surface to type on. I actually like the feel of it in my hand and they're uh, they're very glossy. They do show fingerprints pretty bad. In fact, they show fingerprints just about as bad as a screen turned off, but you can just wipe them off. It's not usually a huge deal, but that is something to keep in mind. This device is pretty fingerprint heavy on the front, but the back is very fingerprint resistant uh, due to the lack of glass back there. And even though you can get a little bit of like grease spots on this soft touch back here, you can usually wipe them away with a microfiber cloth and they're completely gone. It looks literally brand new again if you do that. Now, of course, I used mine with a case for a while, so uh, I can't really attest to the durability of the actual like soft touch back itself. It has maintained perfect condition, but of course I haven't scraped it on anything because I normally keep a case on it when I'm out and about doing stuff. I take the case off usually when I'm here at home. Now to move over to the build quality portion of the review, which is uh, generally another one of the smaller portions of the reviews here. Uh, I'm actually very, very impressed with the build quality of this. Now, many people, when the Key One first launched, probably heard about the fact that there was a lack of adhesive, uh, very, very little on the edges of the screen. Uh, so the screen actually could come out of the device if you were trying to bend it, or in some cases, if you dropped it in the wrong, on the wrong orientation, the screen would actually come out and disconnect. And that's, of course, horrible. Now, I first wanna say that they uh, have since fixed that. They've dumped a ton of adhesive on the back of most devices. Mine's a first generation though and I have dropped it and the screen never came out. My actual assumption when it comes to the whole adhesive issue with the Key One wasn't so much that there wasn't enough adhesive. Uh, it's more so the quality control aspect where I think mo the majority probably have plenty of adhesive to hold the screen in, but there are a few fluke ones out there that had very little for whatever reason. And so they have uh, basically ramped up the amount of adhesive that they put on the bottom of the screen now in order to hold it in. So that's since been completely mitigated, but I also think that the uh, chances of getting a device where the screen could come out are um, definitely were, are, were lower than people really maybe 
realized. But moving on to the, uh, the, the keyboard itself is very, very, very clicky and tactile. It's gotten a little bit more mushy over time, but not drastically so. And uh, enough that it's actually was a little bit harder to type on at first. Now it's uh, soft enough to be comfortable, but it's nothing, uh, it's not mushy like the way the BlackBerry Priv was. Any of you that own that, that keyboard was complete trash, just being completely straightforward. It was terrible. And the space bar has stayed very clicky. So they did put some kind of emphasis on the uh, space bar when it comes to its mechanics underneath seem to be a little bit more reliable. But overall, I think the keyboard's something that's gonna hold up really well. It doesn't, it, it's not really getting many rub marks on it. The only spot that is, is the actual fingerprint sensor, which is built into the space bar, does have this kind of little uh, like sh sh uh, circular shape on it from where I put my thumb on it just to get the uh, reading. And I haven't been able to make it go away by rubbing it like with a microfiber cloth. So I believe that's just slowly getting worn out, but it has to be able to read your fingerprint through it. So somewhat understandable. The rest of the keyboard though has stayed totally, totally fine. Very, very nice. And the, the whole device overall just feels as I drop it, the whole device overall just feels incredibly robust. I actually really like the feeling of this in my hand. It makes me feel like I'm holding a piece of machinery rather than a uh, piece of art, which, you know, both have their ups and downs, but there's something about it where you just, you hold it in your hand and you feel robust. You don't feel like it's gonna break. And I honestly do believe that this would last many, many years, which is uh, I think important because I think a lot of people in the BlackBerry crowd, whether you're a BlackBerry enthusiast or you're a business person that maybe needs a phone like this, you're gonna want it to last a really a long time because who knows when the next quality BlackBerry with a physical keyboard is going to come out. And also there are people that tend to keep their phones longer than a year or two. And I think this is something that's going to hold up over a very, very long period of time, including the keyboard. I think the keyboard is going to stay very clicky over the, its lifespan. And I mean, from the whole metal design to that, again, that soft touch back that I talked about in the design portion, it just feels very, very robust. Uh, the camera lens is protected by that ring that I talked about earlier that it is uh, actually pretty thick and should help protect that from getting screwed scratched and uh, the buttons feel clicky. They have stayed clicky, uh, including this convenience key. More on that in a little bit. It's all just been incredibly well built and I, I think that they did a great job. And honestly, TCL is the company that's manufacturing this, not BlackBerry. So they actually technically get credit for the quality of this. But this is a device that you, you it feels robust and it reminds me kind of like a uh, active series from Samsung, not as um, metallic feeling necessarily because of that soft touch back, but it feels the same robustness where it's heavy, it feels durable, and it looks durable too, to be honest. It feels like something's gonna last you a very long time. So I have pretty much no doubts, assuming you don't get it wet because it doesn't have waterproofing, which is something I would love to see on another iteration, but of course, waterproofing every key on the keyboard here is something that would be definitely challenging. Although again, I'd like to see it done and I would be willing to pay more money for something like that. All right, so now moving over into the performance section of the review, I wanna touch on the screen First, now it's a 4.5 inch IPS display, and honestly, I'm not particularly happy with it. I wish it would get a little bit brighter. 1080p isn't too bad for that screen size by any means, so it's not in a lack of resolution, but it just doesn't, it, it's not as good looking as some of the higher end displays out there. And while this isn't necessarily top tier, there are phones in the price range of, you know, five to 650 bucks that have a nicer screen than this. And it's something I would have liked to see some improvement on. It's uh, not super bad by any means. It's, uh, the text is very crisp and stuff like that. But when you're watching videos or doing anything that has a lot of color in it, it's, uh, you know, and this isn't really a media device, but at the same time, I feel like there just should have been more emphasis on the screen. It, it lacks a little bit of the, uh, uh, satur it's not very saturated and I don't mean oversaturated. I mean, it's actually a little bit undersaturated. We're not talking like I have compared it directly to a Samsung Galaxy S8. And of course the stock setting on that screen is, is very uh, vibrant, but overly vibrant and unrealistic. Uh, but comparing this to maybe something more like the, from the likes of LG, where they tend to have more flat displays, this feels almost too flat. Not terrible, not huge knocks there. And just unless you're planning to watch a lot of video or play a lot of games, I'd say you're gonna be totally fine with the screen that's on this. Now, moving down to the keyboard, the performance of it is really good. Of course, that depends on how good you are at typing. It took me quite a while to get used to typing on this over a virtual keyboard again. And honestly, I like virtual keyboards better myself. I've just, I've learned to adapt to them so drastically that a physical keyboard is just gonna be slower for me. But if you're somebody that really likes a physical keyboard, this here is a very good performing one. It's very clicky. Again, I had the BlackBerry Priv and I ended up using the on-screen keyboard more than the physical keyboard on that because the physical keyboard was just so mushy and disgusting. I absolutely hated that. This is a physical keyboard that you will want to use. So 
assuming that you're not a virtual keyboard person like me. Now moving to the camera section of this, the front facing camera is honestly not very good. It's something that uh, I feel is a little bit overly lacking in comparison to higher end flagships because higher end flagships really honestly are still lacking in the front facing camera department. And so this, I feel like pretty much every phone should be around the same level when it comes to its front facing camera. And this one seems a little bit lackluster in comparison to like my Galaxy S8 that I have. Not horrible, but just if you take a lot of selfies, it's something that you're probably not gonna want to use a particularly large amount. Now, I don't take very many, so it doesn't affect me, and I don't think business people and people that'll be buying this phone really care about selfies that much, to be honest. But the rear-facing camera is a completely different story. So it actually has the same sensor as the Google Pixel. Not the Pixel 2, but the original Google Pixel XL. And uh, it is an incredibly good sensor. Now, of course, the sensor isn't everything when it comes to a camera, especially when you're not doing all manual controls and stuff like you would in my situation where I'm using a, a higher-end uh, you know, mirrorless camera here but on a phone you're not going to be doing a bunch of manual controls most of the time and so it's something to keep in mind is is the processing that goes on afterwards along with the autofocus and stuff like that does actually matter a lot and so the camera is definitely uh, a level above acceptable. It is a very good camera, but it is still beat out by the likes of the Pixel, uh, the new Pixel 2, obviously, the Galaxy S8, the Galaxy Note 8. So there are still cameras that are, you know, flagship phones that are eight, $900 that will beat this, but it is totally great for the price point that you're paying for this phone. You won't be disappointed with it. Unless you're planning to do seriously professional stuff, you're gonna be totally happy with it i really honestly honestly believe so one of the areas i feel it lacks some though is low light performance which is weird because the pixel is actually really good in low light performance and i think that's just all related to the processing afterwards and not directly to the sensor so low light performance not the best but everything else is pretty much fine now the speakers on this are actually something to be touched on they're not your normal just garbage bottom firing speakers so you've got your earpiece speaker nothing particularly special very good quality but nothing that blows my mind or anything Thing, although I do appreciate its larger grill so you're not having to hold it in a very specific spot on your ear to really hear it. I have that trouble sometimes when I make calls with other phones that have the very, very thin grills where the speaker is. Uh, not usually a huge issue, but just something I noticed. But the bottom speakers, and it is bottom firing, are incredibly good sounding. They blow my Galaxy S8 out of the water. In fact, they might even sound better than my LG V20, which was known to have a pretty, pretty good speaker on it. Very, very loud, very crisp, actually pretty solid amount of bass for a bottom firing speaker. Nothing that's gonna blow your mind, of course, but it is something that I think won't be bothered by the fact that it is on the bottom. So a lot of people have trouble with the, when they're on the bottom, they have trouble with the speaker being there because they tend to block it, especially if you're holding it in landscape mode. Realistically, you're not gonna be holding this in uh, landscape mode too often. But even when you do, I've noticed that even though there is, as far as I understand, technically one speaker inside, I haven't actually taken it apart to find out, but uh, if you cover up one of the grills, it doesn't seem to drastically reduce the volume. Like on some phones, like uh, where you have the two grills and you cover up one, nothing happens, you cover up the other, it goes completely silent because it's just one speaker firing out of one grill and the other grill's just for aesthetic purposes. This one does not have that case. So unless you really cover the entire side, you're gonna be totally fine with the speaker there. Of course, it's not really a gaming phone and it's not really a video watching phone, so even then it's not a big deal, but it is nice to have that on here. Now the performance of the actual device is an interesting section to go over for me because it has some serious ups and downs. So it's running a Snapdragon 625 with three gigs of RAM unless you get the higher end model of this that has four gigs of RAM with 64 gigs of storage instead of the 32 gigs of storage that is in this one here. And while that's not a bad chip by any means, it's still an eight core chip and it is pretty powerful, it started to feel lacking about a month into using the device. So at first, the first week, even two weeks, it felt very fast. In fact, there were, it was rare that I noticed a slowdown versus my Galaxy S8, which is running the Snapdragon 835. So I, I was like, okay, this is great. You know, the Snapdragon 625, for me, it seems to be totally fine. But as I used the phone more, as I installed more apps, and especially when I was using more intensive apps, like say Snapchat or something like that, it tended to start to really slow down and the multitasking performance slowed down a lot. That was probably more so related to the RAM than the actual processor performance itself. But it, as Android is known to do, it started to feel a lot slower over time and it really bothered me. And I don't know exactly how to describe the feeling because it wasn't necessarily just lag, although there was the occasional slowdown and stuff. 
uh, it, it just felt like things just didn't feel as snappy as they were supposed to feel. So that's actually one of the reasons that, as I said in the beginning of the video, is it good enough to stay as my daily driver? It ended up not being good enough to stay as my daily driver. And I think if you maybe didn't have a ton of apps installed and stuff like that, you'd probably end up okay. But I actually ended up switching back to my Galaxy S8, despite the worst battery life, more on the battery life of this in a moment. But uh, it just, the performance of the S8 was, is, is so much better. And I start, I wasn't having as many issues with it when browsing social media and stuff. And this ended up just not being exactly what I had hoped. And I now kind of see more why the higher end Snapdragon 800 series is used in flagship smartphones and why people really, I don't think people really play around with the lower end processors for long enough to start to understand how much slower they are. I see, I've seen a lot of reviews of phones with the Snapdragon 625 in them and they all say, you know, it's not that much slower than the 835. And that's what I noticed at first, but that's why I test my phones for such a long period of time. This absolutely feels way slower than the S8, even, at, even including the S8's bloatware as well as its slowdown over a couple month period. This is still slower after a couple of months and it feels like the kind of phone where if you really want to maintain speed, you need to reset it every, you know, two months and that's just a pain in the butt. Nobody wants to do that. Not a huge knock to the device itself because, you know, for 550 bucks, you can't really expect to get a Snapdragon 835 in a phone today. That is a, uh, not a flagship price anymore. Flagship price, you know, is uh, more to the, like the 700 to 800, maybe a $900 range. So it's not a huge knock when it comes to the actual device for its price point and it's not advertised as a major performing device so it's not a huge knock on it itself but it's just something to keep in mind is if you're looking to go to this and you expect great performance and you're used to the performance on something like an s8 with a snapdragon 835 you might be disappointed going to this after a while and now if you're coming from last generation stuff uh it's gonna feel about the same, I'd say, probably. The Snapdragon 625 isn't a complete slouch. It's just not as good as I'd like it to be. Now, the last thing in the performance section that I really wanna to touch on is the battery life. And this has huge score, flying colors everywhere. The battery life on this phone is incredible. So it is a 3,500 milliamp hour battery, which doesn't sound super drastic considering like you've got a 3,500 milliamp hour battery in the Galaxy S8 Plus. So why is this so much better when it comes to the battery life? Well, it's that 1080p display instead of a 1440p display that's also not as bright alongside the, f and also slightly smaller, meaning it doesn't have to be as many LEDs because it is a, a backlit display, along with the Snapdragon 625 and maybe a little bit the fact that it's three gigs of RAM instead of four, although that's probably a very minor uh, little bit there. But yeah, the battery life is incredible. I, and honestly, if I were on Wi-Fi at home, like using it at home, not going out and about doing stuff, if I was doing a lot of messaging, it was possible to get seven or eight hours of screen time out of the thing. And when I was doing things out and about all day long, like I listened to podcasts during work for sometimes six hours in a day. I listened to music for usually an hour or so a day off of the phone through Bluetooth, as well as use it for social media and stuff like that. I was still hitting like the four to five hour mark, which is something that I could never hope to get on my Galaxy S8 Plus. Uh, that, you know, this is just an insane phone when it comes to battery life and it better be for a business oriented phone. That is something that I would generally expect, but I didn't realize the massive difference that having a 625 in there and a 1080p display really would make when it comes to the battery life. And it all comes down to just, you have to match the capacity with the performance of the device. And I feel like something like the S8 needs a 4,000 or 4,500 milliamp hour battery to be what I consider excellent. Because this is a phone where I don't think there was once in the two months that I used it, even on my most hardcore days where I would film some 4K video with it for like, you know, 30 minutes sometimes, where this phone wouldn't get me through the entire day with a minimum of like 15% when I plug it in, when I go to bed, generally closer between the 20 and 40% mark. So if you're looking for a phone with good battery life, this is definitely something to consider, especially if you don't mind the minor slowdowns that come with the Snapdragon 625. It is just a monster on the battery life end. And it does support Qualcomm Quick Charge 3.0 with the USB-C port. So even if you do manage to somehow kill the battery in a day, it'll charge up really, really fast again uh, so that you can continue using it. Although I trickle charge all of my phones overnight but that's just the way I do it I never had to fast charge this during the day though which was super nice and honestly it's a bit of a thicker device and big props to Blackberry for finally doing what I feel is the right thing and hey make the device a little thicker feels more robust and more comfortable in the hand and give it a bigger battery 
because I don't need two thin pieces of glass that's practically sharp and cuts into my hand when I'm holding it. So realistically, I think this is the perfect device when it comes to battery life and when it comes to the business oriented person. So huge props to BlackBerry. I think they have a really good product here. And overall, I would honestly give it an eight out of 10. The only things lacking really are the performance as well as a few features like uh, uh, waterproofing and stuff like that. And the camera's a little bit lacking there as well as the display. But the battery is so good on this phone and the um, stock Android experience, just a few little additives actually on the uh, Android OS here, along with a lot of the fun features like the convenience key that can be programmed to do anything or how on the home screen you can actually press the keys and open up a specific app when you press a key. So you don't have to have all your apps on your home screen. You just press the one of the many keys that that you have on the keyboard here. It's just an overall really, really, really good device. And again, big props to BlackBerry for making something that I finally feel is actually impressive. And this is probably the most impressive device that's come out of them since the BlackBerry Passport, which was not running Android, so I had zero interest in it. It was running BlackBerry 10, which was a terrible OS. The keyboard and everything on that phone was excellent. Then they came out with some touchscreen phones and then they came out with the Priv, which was a slider with the keyboard under it, but the keyboard was so mushy, you might as well not even have the keyboard in there. It was completely useless. And then uh, now you've got the Key One. And they did a really, really good job here. And I can't wait to see what the next iteration of this phone's like, because if they can fix the few complaints that I have about it, it's something that I might consider buying again. Although, We'll see how I feel when the time comes. So thank you everybody for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, leave a comment, and let us know what you think of the review here and what you think of the BlackBerry Key One. If you own one, let us know how happy you are with it or how unhappy you are with it. And don't forget to obviously check out all the links in the description to like our Patreon page if you're interested in giving us a monthly contribution or our website or our forums or various social media links that we have uh, listed down there. And again, thank you everybody for watching.